Hey, this is Rick Gerard with Stride Search. If you're wanting to learn about how to embrace change and navigate through disruption as a leader, then listen to the Leadership is Changing podcast with my good friend, Dennis Giannatsus. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Hey, welcome to the show, Leadership is Changing. What we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Leaders everywhere confront similar obstacles because people are people, but everywhere you go, leaders are overwhelmed, disrupted, and under pressure. They run from email to email, meeting to meeting. Many leaders are not changing quick enough, which means they run the risk of becoming irrelevant and being left behind. So perhaps the show is taking our listeners' leadership to another level by finding their balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. I believe we don't have enough effective leaders in the world today, and if we can get the leaders to step up and lead change, then they can inspire real change. Hey, listeners, it's now time to adapt in our fast-moving world. Hey, listeners, welcome to today's episode. Great to have you with us. I have a wonderful guest with me today, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. His name is Rick Gerard, and he's the founder and CEO of Stride Search Incorporated, an engaged search firm. And he's extremely passionate about helping startup founders win and win the strongest hires to fuel unprecedented company growth. Rick's career has kept him laser focused on building tech startups in the highly competitive Silicon Valley. Over his career, he has helped build more than 200 startup teams that have successfully exited. He's the author of Healing Career Wounds and has invented uh, and systemized the hiring operating system called Hire OS. Rick hosts the Hire Power radio show and podcast. It's a weekly series on LinkedIn Live, which serves as business leaders' resource to solve their most difficult hiring challenges. Rick, a big welcome to you. Hey, thanks for having me, Dennis. I'm happy to be here, brother. Awesome. Whereabouts in the world are you today? So I'm in Newport Beach, California. It's a little cold out here today. It's kind of, it's actually probably more like Auckland weather. <laughs> and, and, and I'm quite surprised you didn't actually, because most, most people from California go sunny California. You didn't say that. Not today. No, it's cloudy. No. Day, which actually, I love it. It's nice. You know, I, I love changing weather. It makes mm. me uh, feel like we're, we're something's going to change at least. Yeah, of course, uh, seasons are changing and things are starting to evolve as you go into spring and into summer. And of course, we're going into autumn or fall, as we call it, some countries call it around the world. And yeah. it's a bit of big change for a lot of us as we go through it. Yeah, we don't get that so much here. There's too many palm trees. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah, good point. We get now, flowers Rick, in the spring. That's really about it. That's good. That's good. It's yeah. good to see flowers, though, right? I mean, it's really nice to see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, Rick, um, I've given our listeners a brief introduction to you. You're the author of a book called Healing Career Wounds. What does that mean? You know, it's, it's actually the punchline. If you, if you want to be able to attract really high caliber talent to your company, then heal their career wounds. So the answer is not money. The answer is not uh, about, you know, it's funny. I, I talked to so many uh, CEOs that, that, that say, well, you know, we can't afford eight players. And I'm like, well, if not with that attitude, you can't. <laughs> but, you know, the funny thing is, is most of the players aren't making a move for money. They're making a move because they need some sort of career growth. They need something that they're not getting in their current organization. And the key to that is understanding what that is and then healing it for them, giving them the opportunity at your company to be able to do that sort of thing, if that's available. Yeah. And it's really that simple. That is simple. Easy to say as well, but not always easy to do, but it's simple. And that's the thing, I think, in life too, that if we keep it simple, It'll actually happen a lot easier, which is good. Absolutely. Mm. And you, you've you got a higher OS. Tell us a little bit more about that too. Yeah. So, you know, we've been doing this for years. We've actually been building like an interview process out for our clients. So whenever we do an executive search for a company, what we do is we come in and we say, okay, we'll do the search. But the way in which we work is we install our hiring operating system, our process, so that what we're doing is we're ensuring that you're able to extract evidence to support whether or not that person should be hired. Not just going off of 
gut feelings and bias and whatever else in the in the that happens in a hiring decision or you know in that interview process but getting actual data to support whether or not somebody's going to be able to excel in the organization and so it's been successful with almost every company that we've we've rolled out with that we've hired for and we've in fact had customers come back to us and say hey can you now install this in our completely in our organization and help us get us up and running in it which has been a great aftermath. So then I started to think, well, how do we scale this? How do we make this available to everyone? I mean, because small businesses need this more so than anybody else. And it's just putting the structure in place and uh, it being able to have a system that you go on, you log onto a browser and then you just run your whole interview through it and make it repeatable and predictable. And so we're actually building out the software right now to scale this, to be able to enable every small business the opportunity to win, win the strongest hires and not have to compete on that whole, uh, you know, well, we lost out because we couldn't pay that much money Mm. scenario. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Now, the Silicon Valley side of things, you're doing quite a bit of work there. I've spent a lot of time in Palo Alto, of course, because of Hewlett Packard where I was. And I used to go to restaurants where we walk down the road and you can see there's a startup happening in, in certain places. And when I say restaurants, they're out the restaurants talking about things or they might be doing it in a private room and they're having a little bit of a launch and things like that. So I can't believe we haven't bumped into each other there. I've probably been there about as much as you have because I, I like I'd go in and I'd come back out. Yep. So it's interesting is I, I've recruited in the Silicon Valley for my whole career. My whole career, however... I haven't really li- lived there ever. So I did a stint. I started out in Sun Valley, Idaho, and then I moved to California. And then I did 10 years in Hawaii, all working that same market and then came back to California. So, um, yeah, I, I tried to move there a couple of times. Was, was it wasn't too successful. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. What was it like living in, and working in Hawaii? It was great. Hawaii is an amazing place. It was a little challenging for me because all I wanted to do was just go surf every day. Right. So, you know, it, it was hard to get yourself into that, the work mode, you know, it, it's so easily, it's so easy to get distracted there. Mm, I bet, I bet, yeah. I bet, yeah. Now we've, um, we've got some questions to go through here around leadership and that. And, and I also want to talk about that, how it relates to the career side of things with people too. Uh, the first question I've got for you is how did you get into leadership? I got in the old fashioned way, which was, hey, you're a high producer. You're doing a great job. Guess what? You're a manager, Mm -hmm. you know, and which is by far the worst way to be promoted because you're just set up for failure. I I remember having so many, so many conversations with my old uh, boss saying, like, can you help me? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I was just having all kinds of uh, challenges. And of course, his his uh, response was, well, just read a book. So I went, I went and took a couple of management courses and tried to get better at it because I, I, was, I was a terrible, terrible manager. And can you remember the books that you read? <laughs> you know, it, it was funny. The book that he recommended was The One Minute Manager and then Who Moved My Cheese. Those were uh, the two that, you know, and then I started getting into, you know, the wisdom of teams because we had a really highly teamwork centric environment. So there was, there was a lot of, and then I started doing sales leadership training because I was in a sales environment. So there was a, a slew of books that I picked up. I, you know, I just, I've always been one of these people where I, I pull like something out of each piece and then kind of put it into my repertoire, if you will. Yep, yep. Into your toolkit, as we call it sometimes as well, a repertoire. It's amazing how many leaders have actually gone that way into becoming a leader. Ta-da! You're the new leader. Congratulations. All the best. See your next performance review. What? Yeah. And then you, you sink or swim. So that happens. But also thinking about how do people actually develop themselves? Because it's not like they've developed you the past of, to prepare you for the role. It is, there it is. And uh, rip the yeah. bandaid off and we found a solution. Here it is. And good luck. Not everyone wants to be a leader in the sense that they want to be more, or well, let me put it another way. I think a lot of people actually miss doing that technical stuff or the stuff that they normally do on a daily basis. Now, all of a sudden, they're the leader or the manager, but they don't actually get to do that stuff that they used to do, uh, and they miss it as well. Do you find that being in the career or the, you know, sort of the hiring process and things like that, do you see a lot of people go get upset or miss that kind of thing and then decide, you know what, I'm going to leave, and they walk, and then we lose the talent from that organization? 
It does happen. I, I don't see it too often. It's usually, it's usually what, what I see often on our search practice is it's usually the person who wants to move into a higher role and it's not available. Right. And so I see more of that. I haven't seen too many people that have, you know, been mentored into a leadership role that got put in there. They're like, hey, get me out of here. I was, I was great at being an individual contributor, but I really enjoyed kind of having more responsibility. So I kind of went after it with full gusto and I made every possible mistake, you know, you could make. There was probably a few days that I, I was willing to hand the keys back and say, you know, let somebody else do this, you know, because it was hard. It was real hard, especially with no training. Yep. 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 And very little mentorship. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I wish, I wish you could say it was more, but yeah, it was trial by fire, which is basically, you know, when you, when you get into doing any sales related positions, the same thing. Mm, mm, mm. Rick, you know, when, um, you've got people who are leaders today and they're wanting to go off and go into a bigger role or go and do something different in their career. What's one or two things that you feel that leaders need to be better at when they come and see an executive search company like yourselves? What What do you think they probably should be preparing to do or come along with and, and do better than they have been in the past? You you mean when they're looking for a role? Yeah. You know, I, I think it's really important that uh, leaders are able to tell a story about their accomplishments or what they've done above and beyond having four years of this and five years of that and three years of something else, right? It's, it's really important that you can, you can tell a story about exactly what you've done as opposed to what your team did or what you delegated out. Because really, uh, I think that's one spot where most managers fail quite frequently is they talk about kind of how they pulled the team together, but they didn't really do anything. They just kind of, kind of kept the, the balls in the air and then delegated everything. So when, you know, I think what people want are they want people who can step in when they need to and actually go in and fix the problem, but then also, you know, kind of elevate those around them and, and help to, you know, pull the load to make sure that, that everybody's going to be successful. Okay. That's not, good. Not just kind of pulling them into a meeting and saying, why aren't you meeting your goals? What's going on? All right, well, do better next week, you know? Mm. That's just a cheerleader, really? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So so that's that's one. What would be another thing that you think that these executives or leaders should be preparing when they're coming to have the conversation with a, with an exec search company? You know, the other thing is that I think they need to have clarity in where they want to go. Mm. And and you'd be amazed on on how many people, you know, they, they just know that they don't want to be where they are, or maybe they're looking, they're out of work. But when you ask them, you know, so what is it that you desire to do? What, what What's important to you? What type of work? You know, the, the lack of clarity sometimes, if you don't know where you want to go, you're never going to get there. Mm. And, and so make the job easy for the search firm. You know, hey, look, at I've identified four or five companies that I think I'd do really well at. Can you get me in there? You know, and here's why I think I would do well with these companies. You know, I think before this show started, I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of frustration with recruiters, but we spend our time servicing our clients. And so it's, you know, well, we're in, in we're going to try to get the strongest people into the organization. If you can't demonstrate that, then we're not going to pay very much attention to you. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think you're so right in what you're saying here, because the clarity is really important. What really blows me away is I'm actually doing the coaching with them and, and, and helping them things uh, with things about their future, if they wanted to think about where they want to go next or maybe they have lost, they've come out of an organization for certain reasons. What's quite interesting is that they don't have clarity. And then okay. I go, whoa, so you don't actually have clarity, but then you've got this, this senior role that you're working with in an organization. So if you like this personally and you don't know where you're going, how the heck were you doing a job and, and helping an organization go in a certain direction? Because it, it doesn't marry up here. No, I think it's really easy to find those holes too. You know, like... I mean, as recruiters, we 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 can identify those pretty quickly, and and we know a high performing manager. You know, we can we can tell we've got somebody who's good. It's not just because of the company. You know, one of the things that one of the characteristics that all A players share is they can tell you exactly how they did something step by step. And if you don't have clarity on that, then you know you're probably just sitting in there pushing paper around. Yep. 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 Absolutely. Now, the other thing too, I'd like to ask you, and we get into the more of the questions as we go through. A lot of leaders say to me, "Oh, LinkedIn. I look. I, I don't. I don't really do social media. What's your thoughts on 
today's executives, do they need to be working within LinkedIn? Do they need to be doing things? What, what's your thoughts? So I, I'm going to be kind of contrarian here. No, I don't think they need to be on LinkedIn. And I also don't think that they need to be, you know, writing resumes, like especially if they're good at what they do. There's a lot of really top player individuals out there that don't have a resume. And if you looked at their LinkedIn profile, they look like, you know, it's, it's bare minimum. Mm-hmm. It's the company name. I work on X, right? I, I, I revel in those types of LinkedIn profiles because I think this person's really busy. They're too busy to write a LinkedIn profile. But when somebody has way too much information on their LinkedIn profile, like myself, <laughs> but we're in the media, you know, when, when you have way too much information on your LinkedIn profile, it just kind of tells me, well, you've actually got the time to do that. So, uh, you know, in, and LinkedIn has now become a, a it, it's really a, a sales medium more so than anything else. It's for yeah. salespeople who are trying to get a hold of you because my inbox is flooded with sales emails and then recruiters. So it, it's not what it really ha- was intended to be anymore, mm-hmm. unfortunately. I think it's your shop front, right? It's really just to say, here I am, and then people can know we, they can go to to find you out. Or if they go in the search engines, that tends to be one of the first things that come up, which is interesting to see. But I see yeah. people in there about, and, and, the, and they have like a, this, this book, this huge amount of information. I'm like, people aren't going to read that. People are just, just a short paragraph, very clear, yeah. crisp. It's really good, but um, yeah, it's interesting. All right, so good, yeah. some good, good conversation. There. Something else you want to add there around that? No, I was going to say that's that's spot on what you were just saying. You're you're right. Mm-hmm. Now here's an interesting question for you. This person could be alive or from history. Who's your favorite leader and why? Well, I have two. My favorite from history was actually King Leonidas. I don't know if you've heard that one before, but I was always fascinated with the Spartan culture when I was when I learned about it coming up. And, you know, just the sacrifice that he made for his people and how he held off like a massive army with, you know, there was more than 300, but, you know, roughly 300 people was, you know, the strategy and the thought that went into it and the passion that went into it, you know, and, and ultimately dying at the end to, to keep his people safe. I mean, that, that was, you know, what a better story. I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't ever heard a better story. The other, we, the other leader that I admire is myself in five years. Nice. <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> I'm working really hard to get my, myself to be an amazing leader. So Good on you. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Now, the first example you gave, are we seeing that being played out today in, with the Russia-Ukraine side of things? Are we seeing that? Kind of, yeah. Kind of? Yeah. Mm. yeah, I think so. Actually, I, I mean, I, I don't really follow... I don't follow media really at all because, I mean, quite frankly, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed with it, but I don't have time. But yeah, what I have seen, wow, that that, uh, Ukrainian president's amazing. Mm, Cool. Now, I was going to ask you the next question, which was around King Leonidas, uh, about something around that. But actually, I'm going to ask something about yourself because, actually, I'm going to ask it two ways. If you were sitting on a park bench with yourself in the future, right, and you're talking to yourself in the future and you wanted to ask yourself a question. Yeah. What would that question be? If I'm asking my future, <laughs> did I move fast enough? <laughs> mm, okay, good. All yeah. right. That's good. And did uh, I move fast enough? Did I bring in the right people? Like, did I bring in the right, like right now I'm doing a capital raise. So like that's, I'm learning all this right now. So did I bring in the right investors? You know, did I make the right decisions? Yeah. I mean, obviously five years from now, you know, all I need is a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all you need, right? So interesting question. Now, your number one favorite, or well, your first favorite that you shared, if you were sitting there with the king and and and, and actually having a, a coffee there and and talking with him, what would be one question you want to ask him? Oh man, you know, I, I, there'd be way more than one question because I'm like I'm intellectually curious. So like I would want to know all about the 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 hoplite and like how they actually you know use their shields and I like I don't know. I'm a geek about that. I I would get geeky into the the culture and, you know, maybe even him growing up and how he, you know, passed his trials to become king and, you know, some of these other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I don't think I'd, I, I, I don't know. I, I would just, I, I, t- I take that as like such a learning moment that I just, I would have so many questions. I bet. Yeah. It would be wonderful. You could do that. I just imagine it. Eh? Be pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. It would be awesome. Yeah. Can you make it happen? Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> now, the, the title of the show is called Leadership is Changing. Uh, when I mentioned that title or that statement, what does that mean for you? 
You know, I one of the things that I talk about, one of the things that I've been learning lately is that, you know, with this great resignation that we're having here or the great reset, however you want to categorize it, you know, through the pandemic, the people have changed. The mindset has changed. And it's not really about going to work for somebody and, you know, kind of making them wealthier and, and getting little, very little back. And so I think with this time frame, this time that we had, a lot of people got to think about what was important to them. And so there's been a shift. And the shift is that it's not about the money so much anymore. You know, it's about growth. It's about, it's about learning. It's about things that are more important to that person's career other than just kind of sitting in there and pushing a button advancement. And so when it comes to leaders, you know, I, I, I hear a lot of leadership pushback and, you know, my staff doesn't want to come back and this doesn't want, they don't want to do this. And they don't, you know, they're being difficult. You got to listen to your people because right now people are voting with their feet and it's very easy to just go get another job, you know, and it, and it's very easy to get something that like is more in alignment with what I want. And so I think as a leader, you really need to go back to your values and, and drill down on what are the values of my company and, and almost kind of do a, do, are we living those values and are these values being utilized in such a way we can attract the right people and repel the wrong ones? Mm. Yeah. Spot on, spot on. And if the organization is not living their values, what needs to happen? Well, I mean, it's no secret if they're not, I mean, you know, people figure it out very quickly. And people leave. So like if you've got a lot of, if you're hiring people and you still have attrition that's going on, well, that's where you're failing. You know, it's not, it, it, it's not because, it, it's purely because people are just not going to put up with it anymore, mm. right? And it's not because they're flaky people. It's because most of the time they got sold something different than what they experienced when they started up on day one. Yep. So, you know, you should be honest about who your company is. If you are a, you know, a, an environment of hunters and, you know, it's all about, hey, look at it, you eat what you kill and we're going to stab you in the back. If you're not looking, you know, you got to be on your guard, then you need to hire people that thrive in that environment. Don't hire people that are in a collaboration and teamwork, you know, in a, in a kumbaya environment and, and expect that they're going to do well because they won't, mm. you know. Mm. And then, you know, again, I mean, it just all comes back to like those words on the wall. If you're not living them at a leadership level then nobody's going to leave, you know, nobody's going to live those. And it springs from the top down. So whatever you have, those words on the wall being, you should be honest with yourself. It should be, it should be those things that are valuable to you. Mm. Yeah. And you're talking about the walls and the, the, the words on the wall, that's the value statement or what are the values of the organization. And Rick, yeah. sometimes they, they think it's so important and so, yeah, they go and laminate it and then they'll put it on the wall and it's everywhere. But the thing is, if you don't bring it to life and you're not living it every day, then it's just a bunch of words, as you're saying, right, on the wall. And that's that's what it's doing. Um, yeah, and it should be it should be a language within the organization. I mean, uh, I always state the example of Amazon. Amazon does an amazing job of they they make decisions based on their leadership principles. And so, you know, and and you can see how they've grown throughout the years. This was early, early on back when Amazon first sprung up. They always hired for uh, value alignment first and skills second. And everybody else has it flipped. You know, it's all about the skills. And then, oh, well, you know, we think we'd like to have a beer with you, so let's hire you. Mm. Yeah, we see there's, that's a difference, isn't it? I mean, that's that's a huge difference. And it is just flipping it. And you're right, there are a lot of organizations, most organizations the other way around. It's got to be a culture fit. There has to be that culture fit and going with the values, which is really interesting. But I think culture is kind of too high level, actually. You need yep. to go deeper than culture because hmm. culture is really how people work, like act around the water cooler when you're not looking, right? That's, that's the culture. But, you know, those actions are driven by your values. So if, if you as a leader have created an environment where it's like, it's a harsh environment, it's just going to perpetuate downstream. Do you know, when, when I, so I was involved a lot with the merger of EDS being an IT company and Hewlett Packard, right? HP being an IT company. And I used to do a lot of these uh, um, sort of sessions with leaders, but I would show uh, a video for 15 to 20 minutes talking about Bill and Dave's values and the way that the organization was built. 
And you had a lot of EDSs in there, uh, Lex EDS people who were sort of like, well, but we were with Ross Perot and this is what our values and so forth were. And when I played the video, people from EDS days were like, one lady I was in this, she cried. And I was like, what's going on here? She goes, it's the same values as us. And I'm like, hello. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's very similar. It's, it's almost the same. But yes, you're right. But here you are, you're trying to fight this as two organizations to say yeah. that ours is better and theirs is better. But at the end of the day, we are one of the value now. And now we're in a new organization. Here are the values of what, what we are and what it stands for. And let's get on with it. So I yeah. think sometimes people use that as an excuse or stand behind it. And it should be, we should be facing it and talking about it. And I love what you say. The values should be the language of the organization. And I think that's absolutely that's, that's brilliant. And, and, and what you make decisions based off of. You know, um, there's another call, company called Twilio. I don't know if you heard of them, but they put yep. their values out there pretty, pretty f- much in the front. And it's a language within the organization when you're having meetings and you're making decisions, you know, people challenge it. I don't think that is aligning with our value. And, and so that's how decisions are made and, and that's how they've been able to grow. Mm. You know, the, that's the root of their success. Yeah. I think it's great. I think that's, yeah, that's- if you don't have that. If you don't have that, uh, you know, what did Benjamin Franklin say? If you fail to plan, plan to fail. There you go. Now, the other thing, too, I think this is true for individuals. What are your values? And so when you're going for a role or looking to go to a company, and this is the company I want to work with, it's the values, again, is their alignment and, and making sure that's happening, too. But a lot of people don't actually understand what their own values are. Um, I think they need, to, no. they need to understand that. You know what? I... I... <laughs> Again, I, I've had a couple like uh, executives that I've coached over the years that they're like, I have no idea what I want to do. I, I don't know, you know. So, you know, go to the beach and meditate over the weekend, do something, you know, get your head clear and really think about what it is you want to do. Really think about what your values are, you know, think about mm-hmm. how you're positioned because, you know, the other, the other mistake I see a lot of people do is, you know, they'll chase the money. You know, Amazon's making me a huge offer. Great. How are you going to do over there? Um, you're, you're not really a large company person. You're not going to do well in politics, you know, in, and, and the adverse is correct too. You know, you come out of Amazon going to a startup, you're going to be overwhelmed with lack of resources and, you know, pure, pure chaos, you know, and a lot of people set themselves up to fail that way, unless it's something that you really, really want that you're not getting. Mm. So knowing what you want helps you get there. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, really good. Now, you and I and the rest of the world, we're living in a world that's fast-paced, ever-changing. Data, social, technology, business, it's just getting fast and maybe even faster. Now, the thing here is what makes a leader successful in that fast-paced, ever-changing world? You know, in my world, it's actually slowing down and hiring slower rather than hiring fast because I'm... Yeah, again, in my world, it's it's mainly smaller companies. And, you know, if you're a company that's under 100 people, you know, 50 and, and, and smaller, it, every person that you bring on board, it could be life or death to the company. And it doesn't really matter who they are, right? So you you really want to take your time and then move fast when you need to, to, to get them on board. You know, the, we, we, we move really fast to get somebody hired. And then once they start, then you move really slow to get them, you know, like integrated in the company. Well, flip it, you know, hire slower or, you know, like take your time, make sure you got the right person on board. And then when you get them in, make sure that you're integrating them properly and spending the time quickly to get them up to speed, invest in their training, invest in, uh, you know, take the time to make sure that they're going to be successful, Hmm. you know, rather than just kind of, all right, well, here's your chair and here's our manual and good luck. We'll see you. We'll see you at a quarterly meeting. Yeah. And don't forget to water the pot plant in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Figure it out. Yeah. Where's, where's my car park? Um, so, you know, it's just there's there's all sorts of things that go on through people's minds as well. So it's good good insights here. So I think uh, higher, slower, um, and slow things down. So there's always that saying out there, go slow. Oh, just... Um, Go slower to go faster. I think it's or slow down to go. No, slow down to go faster is the way it's. Yeah, it, you know, I think that's that's sort of goes along those lines, which is good. But you're right. You got to get the right people on board. You got to get the right people. Now, you and I have been talking about the lens through the lens of a leader. 
let's flip this around now and talk about the lens of an employee. Yeah. And how has employees' expectations of leaders changed? Oh, well, I, I think it's pretty obvious that they want their leaders to take an active role in their development. I mean, that's, that's you know, first and foremost, that's what I, you know, I've heard throughout my whole career, you know, people don't quit companies, they quit managers, right? And so uh, don't be a manager, be a leader and really spend the time investing in your people and getting them to where they want to go. I'm noticing that the people that are difficult to recruit out of companies right now are the ones who are being career path, right? So they have a plan. If you, you know, over the next year, we're going to do this, 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 and this, you're going to accomplish these things. We're going to move you to here, right? It's not just this kind of nebulous thing hanging up in the sky, like, hey, look, at here's a carry. Hopefully you'll get it. You do great. If you don't, sorry, really take the time to sit down with your people and plan it out for them and ask them, where do they want to go? There's, there's going to be some people that don't want to be a leader. They just want to stay on the technical track. So keep them there and keep them engaged, keep them learning, you know, keep cultivating them. I, f- I feel like what we do as leaders is we just plant a bunch of seeds. And then as soon as it's time for harvest, you know, we just see you later. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Rick, you know what's quite interesting is my and I had an experience when I was in Palo Alto and I got to sit down with a senior vice president and he said to me, where do you want to go in five years time in your career, Dennis? And I was like, wow, that's cool. I, there's not many people and leaders will sit down and ask me that. My man and my leader might, but we wouldn't be talking about five years. But then he says to me this, and I accept, and I thought, do I say it to him? Because what I wanted to say was, I want to leave and I want to have my own business doing executive coaching, facilitation, traveling the world, doing that. And I thought, do I say it or not? And I thought, no, I'm not going to have a lot of opportunity to talk to this guy because I'm going to go back to New Zealand. That, let's do it. So I did it. And he said to me, awesome. Let's make, let, let's see what we need to do to help you do that and make that, that, that come true and bring it to life. I was like, wow, this is different. And then yeah. I said to him, I actually said to him, this is really refreshing to hear. And he goes, but remember where you're sitting, Dennis. And I says, oh, what's that? You're sitting in the buildings, Dave and Bill were around Hewlett and Packard, right, days. And their whole thing was about helping entrepreneurs get started. Yeah. So you're sitting in this build, these buildings, exactly what this is where they're, they're, our ethos is, right? This is where we've come from as an organization. And that's why we want to help you do that. And I think if we can help people do that, it's good. But then as, you're, as you said, those organizations that give people a clear path and they understand where they're going next, will it happen 100%? It may not, it may change, but people know where they're going course they're going to stay it's hard but you bring up a great point though like you know the best the next move is for you was out right and so being okay with that and and you know at least not it gets you to the point where you're not getting blindsided once the person says hey look at i want to leave and you're like why you never told me you were unhappy i'm not unhappy i just wanted to start my own business i've it's been this way for a long time so as a leader you should have known that so you could plan to backfill, you know, to, to kind of have somebody cultivated along the, your training so that when you step out, I can support you as much as, as, as possible. And we can provide somebody else a growth opportunity. That's to me, like what good leadership is. Do you know that just because he said that to me, what he said, and based on what you're just saying as well, I stayed longer. Yeah. And so I was, I was, uh, there was more loyalty there, right? Which is, which is interesting to see. Yeah. Now, yeah. Rick. I want you to get your crystal ball out here now. We have to talk about the future. Where do you see leadership being in five years? <laughs> you know, okay, so in, in my world, I would hope that people actually really start to understand their employees and they take the time to focus on people mm-hmm. before profit, before the business, before the daily minutia of what's going on, before putting out fires. Um, that's what I would like to see. You know, I would like to have seen that 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I mean, I, I think we're long overdue and I think leaders are going to have to evolve there. Otherwise, they're just going to keep having, like they're just going to fail over and over again. So this kind of mindset that people are in right now is, is I think, wonderful for getting leaders to wake up. Mm, very good. Yeah, excellent. Well, Rick, thank you for joining us on today's show. If our listeners are wanting to get hold of you, where should they go? So you can find me at stridesearch.com, S-T-R-I-D-E. S-E-A-R-C-H dot com. I also host a weekly podcast and radio show called Higher Power, and that's H-I-R-E, Power. It's not a religious show. You can find my book on Amazon. It's called Healing Career Wounds. And, you know, I, I'm pretty, I, I take a little while to get, I get a lot of emails. So like 
somebody wants to drop me an email at rickatstridesearch.com, more than welcome to you as well. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Well, Rick, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I've had a lot of fun. So thank you uh, for being here yeah. with me. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. It's been awesome meeting you. Hey, listeners, what we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Change is incredibly scary, especially with the unknown and unfamiliar territory. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing. Look out for the episodes as they're being released. Download them, have a listen, put a review and a rating. Feel free to share them with your friends, your family, and your network. Hey, if there's any feedback you'd like to give me about the show, or if there's a question you have for the Ask Dennis Freestyle episode, then send me an email, dennis at leadingchangepartners.com. Hey, listeners, it's always a pleasure being with you. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast-moving world. 